it tends to have more value these days. And of course, your authentication servers are the keys to your kingdom. These will give you a good central base of what activity is occurring across your network and the times and locations from which uh, the activity is originally. For example, Windows logs. Uh, this, I will take a minute to talk about these because this is, a, let's face it, the reality is Windows still dominates the marketplace. So let's talk a little bit of specifics on, on how to cull through a Windows log, uh, the event logs to actually look for indicators. Uh, that's a summary slide that'll be, it was gonna pick this up, I believe they're making this downloadable. But let's, let's take a, a specific example. One of the most problematic things I see in networks to this day, and it just makes me shake my head, this is still going on, but it is, um, local administrator passwords. So in typical networks, you will have your domain. The domain has the domain controllers, that holds the keys to the kingdom. All of the domain-wide usernames and passwords are stored there. The credentials are valid anywhere in the domain. Now, each individual system that makes up the network also has a local account. And by default, there's a local administrator account with relative ID 500 that sits on each of these boxes. Now, when most IT shops go out to deploy your network, they simply, when they boot up the system or load it up from a ghost or they're pushing it out uh, through a GPO, they get the initial layout and they just put a default password in for that local administrator account because they're never intending to use it and they have to have some sort of password. Well, when you end up with the same local administrator password scattered throughout the entire network or 80% of the computers in the network, it's effectively like having a nice big key to your kingdom laying around if you're not watching. Uh, and I, to this day, I, I, I continue to go to clients and they have this set up and I'm just befuddled at, at, at how prevalent this is. So when you have this set up, the local SAM file, the security account manager that's holding all of this data, is accessible to anybody who has physical access to it. You just boot up from a Linux CD, extract this data, drop it into a, a, a password crack like rainbow crack, and you can pull that data out with, with no problem. You can do it remote with a PW. Uh, so the local SAM file is sort of low-hanging fruit. So when you have a network like this where any intrusion into the network, they can pull the SAM file out, crack the password, now they have this local administrator password. And a lot of admins to this day are still thinking, well, big deal, they already own that box. And now they have the administrator password of that box. But when you use the same password on your other systems, and they know that password now, they can easily use standard Windows sharing to map to that default admin share on each one of these other PCs using that local credential. And now all they're doing is they're mapping to the root of the drive. That gives them access to all of the data. They can change it, they can do whatever they need to. And then they can use a command like psexec to push any other software they want to and execute code on these boxes with administrator credentials. So we still see a lot of this. You get an initial vector, and then once they get in through uh, an exploit, then they start using this type of method to just keep jumping all around the network and ripping havoc. So how do, how do you detect this kind of thing? What are some of the indicators? Event logs with Windows track uh, two primary logon-related events. Uh, in the 500 series, the logon events, this is actually tracking access to resources. The uh, incredibly poorly named account logon events actually is uh, giving these authentication events. So if a username, password, or other credential is presented to an authority and they say, is this a valid account, that's an account logon or an authentication. If someone uses a valid credential to access a resource, a file, a system, whatever it may be, that's a logon event. So under normal behavior, looking at a domain, you have the domain controller over here that holds all the usernames and passwords, whatever authentication you have going on in your domain. Dual factor, whatever it may be. And over on the other side, you have just the client. Now, normally a person will sit down, control, all, delete, get the box, put in your credentials, token, password, whatever. That box makes no determination as to whether or not you're allowed on there. It just does a mother may I and goes over to the domain controller. Hey, domain controller, you hold the keys to the kingdom. You have all the list. Here's the credentials provided by this user on these battles. Domain controller checks its authoritative list, says yes or no. Assuming it's a yes, it comes back with a ticket granting ticket. 
And what it does so it logs an event ID 6 using local accounts is you start seeing actual authentication events appearing on individual systems as opposed to only appearing on your domain controller. So you end up with 680 events scattered throughout your network. This is bad. In most cases, local accounts should not be used at all. So when you see local machines making authentication decisions, that's an indicator, a fairly substantial indicator that you've probably been owned. And if you happen to have one of these network setups where your admin password and local accounts is the same, yeah, that's bad. Now, the other thing I mentioned that is very common with this is PSExec. It's, it's such a common attack vector that Microsoft finally decided to add a special event log just to uh, document its use. So whenever PS exec gets pushed out, whenever someone starts remotely accessing systems and running processes, PS exec process execution, it's just running a process remotely on your system. And now Microsoft has generated uh, two event IDs, 7035 and 36, that will actually document that it's going on. So that's another good indicator log based that you might want to scour. All right, so you've gone through, you've looked at your IDS logs, your firewall logs, your Windows logs, whatever it may be. You've realized, okay, there's some anomalous behavior. We've identified some systems that we think, uh, okay, there might be a problem here. So now what? You've got a system in your hand. It's sitting there and it's suspect. You think this box is owned. How do you verify it? How do you actually go into detecting yes or no on this particular system? Uh, three main components to doing so. Monitoring the network traffic. Now, whether this is network traffic that has been previously monitored or you set up a sniffer dedicated on that machine, you're going to want to catch a sample of the traffic to see if there's anything strange leaving that computer that you're uh, not expecting. You're going to analyze the running processes, looking at the RAM before you unplug the system. And then after you've done all that, forensically image the data and analyze it offline. So this first part, monitoring the traffic. When you monitor the machine, you could use historical log files if they're available. If you have something like network forensics or NetWitness in place on your network that is capturing data packets, you can go through. They're exceptional tools. They can log data, archive it for a period of time, full packet capture with metadata extracted out as well. So you can do uh, very quick queries looking for it. Once you've identified it, an infected system will beacon to the following IP address. Well, then go back to the logs and query, show me everybody that's communicated with that IP address in the last week. And then you can start seeing other hosts that are infected popping up all over the place. So having that type of system in place before the incident, again, very useful. If on the other hand, you don't have that, and they are very, very expensive systems to put in place, uh, stick Wireshark up, throw a hub in, see what is going across. And I would use uh, an external monitoring source. I wouldn't try running it just from your system because if there's a root kit involved, it may be hiding all the traffic from you. But if you can actually monitor the wire, capture it for an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever you think you can afford to do prior to taking it offline and see if there's any anomalies that are detected. After you've monitored the network traffic, let's look at the RAM itself. Now, when you get into memory forensics, this is really an emerging field of computer forensics in general. Um, standard incident response techniques have been used for years to look at things like the running processes, the open ports, what is the system doing, what are the active connections, who's communicating with it, what IPs are connected, et cetera. Um, what's more relatively recent is actually dumping the full contents of RAM to do binary analysis. What we see with a lot of intrusions is that the attack vector sticks a piece of code up in RAM, and obviously it's executing and doing whatever evil it's designed to do. When you take the system offline, you have to deal with the fact that the code on disk is probably packed at the minimum or potentially even encrypted. So while it's still up in RAM and running, doing a full RAM dump and then extracting the binary straight out of RAM in order to do a, a, a disassembly of it and reconstruct what it's doing, that's the best time to do it. Now that is really sort of just starting to emerge as, as forensics practice. Now what we've been doing for years is querying the RAM. We don't dump the RAM, we ask the system using standard tools to give us information, interpreted information about what's running on the system, what ports are open, data that's stored only in RAM. 
Uh, NetStat is, is the standard method of extracting information about the uh, ports that are open and active. Task list or the PS command on the Unix side of the house, this is the standard method of extracting information about the processes that are running within the system. Now these two are fairly non-invasive. You can run these from a CD, drop them on the disk, or drop them in the system, bring your own command shell with you on that CD that's trusted, execute the commands and export them to a floppy disk or just to the screen or dump them back to a USB drive, whatever you want to get involved with. And then this will provide you with the information as to what the system was doing at the time. Now if you want to get a little more invasive but also get more information out, Tools like WinAudit, which is available on the Helix Instant Response CD, uh, or Process Monitor, the old system internals tool, it used to be RegMon and FileMon, now they've just got ProcMon. Um, you can install those on the system and let them run. Now again, you're altering a lot more data on the system, but at the same time, you're getting a lot more information back out from these reports. They're fairly in depth. We'll look at a WinAudit, uh, some samples from a WinAudit report here in a minute. Now, those again are not going to give you a full dump of the memory. They're just going to give you some information about what is going on on that system. And then you can wade through it relatively easily through a report. The other option is to dump the entire contents of the RAM, dump it to an image file, and then analyze it offline. Um, on the commercial side of the house, there's a tool called HB Gary Responder that's been out for about 18 months, 24 months, something along those lines, that really is sort of the state of the art in this technology. They're able to dump the RAM and then manually uh, parse through the RAM structures to show you, they'll you know, walk the PS list, they'll do all of these techniques to actually extract information about what was happening on that system at the time. And it sort of follows the standard best practice in forensics of take an image, secure the image, and then analyze the image rather than working on a live system. So they have a tool called FD for fast dump that you can run, it pushes out the data, it dumps it to uh, external media, and then their, their, their responder tool is able to go through and actually break it back out, parse out the structures, and will even allow you to pull the binaries right out of the, the RAM image file, the RAM dump, and then reverse them so that you can see what's going on at the time. Um, the, the reason I say this is still sort of an evolving process, everything in RAM, or everything that the system is doing is not always in the RAM. It's dumped into swap space or page file. And it's still sort of, in flux. When data has been dumped to page file, reconstructing the page file, re, uh, putting it back into a virtual memory space so that everything can be extracted and interpreted correctly, it, it's, the technology is not 100% there yet. So querying the RAM, uh, I'd say, is still sort of where most instant response is at. Dumping the RAM is, is coming. So what are you looking for either way, whether you dump it or you query? Um, some of the names. The, service, the names of the services, the names of the files that are running can be very uh, informative. For example, why are the two up there of interest? The SVDC host and SVC host. What is, why is that an obvious clue? Yeah, it's spelled wrong. What's it trying to look like? Yeah, a legitimate Windows process, which is spelled SVC host, singular. What does SVC host do? Actually, I, does anyone, I, I don't even have to tell me. I'm just curious. I mean, this is a very educated group I'm talking to. The, you know, this, this is, you know, one of those top tier groups here. How many of you legitimately know what SVC host does? See, even in this room, only a handful of people feel confident enough that they know that, that they'll raise their hand in case I actually ask them. <laughs> so that tells me that when you know most systems administrators know this about SCC host. It's supposed to be there. That's the extent of the knowledge. They have absolutely no idea what it does. They just know it's supposed to be there. And once I tried to kill one and things broke back. So hackers take advantage of this. This is one of the most common names for an evil process. What service host is? is nothing more than a process space that you can load DLLs up into. A DLL or dynamic link library is executable code. And 
Basically, they sit on your box, and when people write programs, they're allowed to make references to code that exists in these dynamic link libraries. Same with units, you have standard libraries. So, as a process spawns up, it's allowed to load multiple DLLs into its process space, the executable space and RAM for that process. Well, there are many services in Windows that are written as a DLL. They're not written as an entire process. And so the SVC host, the service host process, spawns up, gives it a working environment, and then just imports DLLs as needed for these various services that exist as DLLs to run. So if you run uh, the task list command, with this slash SVC switch. Well, the first thing that's going to do is it's going to show you what DLLs, what services are running underneath each one of your SVC hosts. And if you see something that's running as SVC host and it doesn't have any services under it, yeah, that's a clue. Um, that's probably just a renamed process that is trying to masquerade as something it's not. Additionally, rogue DLLs exist that can be loaded up into a legitimate SVC host. So you have to start digging into what those are as well once you start actually executing these. But SVC host is one of the most common names for any sort of malware. And you'll, you'll see that it's either going to be like this, where they're just slightly misnaming it. That S at the end is very common. The, the double B is also quite common. The other thing they'll do, though, is they'll just put it in the wrong place. Most of your typical Windows files are in either the system root, which is Windows, or system root slash sys32, system32. Um, and so you can get a service named SVC host, just put it in another location, and when you do something like task list, it looks right. You have to dig a little deeper. Now, if you use the win audit or the proc mod, I said you get a little more bang for your buck, it's a little more invasive, but you get more information. One of the things you get is the full path to that uh, PE file, the executable file, that actually spawned the process. And then it will become a little more obvious, hey, this is the right name with the wrong location. Question? Yeah, um, the system is owned already. You can inject a process and say to the task that the process not appear. So you don't even see them. 100% correct. If your system is already owned, then they can insert a process into kernel mode, into the kernel space itself, that actually lies to any of the tools you run. The problem you run into here is that the, the, the operating system itself, including uh, all of the drivers that you install, run in the kernel of the operating system. And anything that's running in the kernel of the operating system can lie to any program running what's called user mode. Now, every analysis tool you can run on a live system runs in user mode. Even if it's running as administrator, it runs in user mode. Now, you can get some tools, such as Rootkit Revealer, that will dump a uh, a driver as part of their software. That driver code runs in kernel mode, and then you get this little race condition as to is the bad kernel code or the good kernel code going to get there first in order to show you the truth. So uh, Rootkit Reveal is a freeware you can download that you can run, and it does some of these types of checks to see, okay, let me ask the system what processes are running. Now let me manually walk the list of processes and do a comparison and see if it's lying to me. And if it is, it throws a big flag. But, and this is, this is another one of those things that you, know, you go in to uh, install software and it says, this driver is unsigned. And you say, I don't care, I just bought this printer. Install. Well, the reason that Microsoft bothers to do this driver signing thing is every single driver runs in permanent. So whatever code you just said, yeah, go ahead, is running in the kernel of your operating system. Um, it, it, it's, it's like adding a module to a Unix system. So when, when you add something as a kernel module, you're giving an extreme control over your system. It's able to lie to any analysis tools you're using that are run in user mode, and it can get fairly ugly very quickly. So again, you are 100% correct. This technique is not 100%. There is no 100% technique uh, to detect. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the offline stuff we do and why, for that exact reason. Yeah, we cannot execute, like, take the memory back from another machine. Like, you can do an external scan from somewhere safe, that you consider safe, to get this information, right? Yeah, now, you mentioned external scans. One of the things I will talk about later is, um, because of the fact that, say you want to know what processes are running, as well as uh, what ports are open on your box. Is it listening on something it should not be listening on? 
Uh, one of the things you can do is type in the, uh, the netsat command. netsat ano on the Windows side or AMP on the uh, Unix Linux side. And that'll give you a listing of all the ports, what they're doing, and what process is using. Now, the problem is, again, rootkits. If someone has a rootkit that's gone in in kernel mode, it's going to lie to you. It's going to hide anything that it doesn't want you to know about. So what we often recommend is before you actually pull the plug, after you've done your RAM analysis, you've dumped whatever you're going to dump, or you've queried whatever you're going to query, hit it with an external port scan. Actually, go to a safe machine and port scan your box from the outside. Because if that port is listening, it's going to show up. Now, if you're using something like port knocking, where you have to hit port 4443, then 4445, then 4447, before it actually activates the actual listener ear host. But most of the time, if they've got one that is on the box, it's an active TCP port, it's listening, but it's got a root kit that's going to lie to you when you query locally, that external scan will detect it. And then again, if you, if you look at your NetSat results, contrast those to the port scan results, problem. They don't match up, there's something wrong. Good question. Here's a, here's a walkthrough. Um, all right, here was a box we thought might be compromised. So we actually put uh, a healing CD, uh, one of the, the old version 3 that was still free. Uh, got the ISO, drop it on. Uh, one of the instant response tools that's on Helix is WinAudit. Run the WinAudit program, it goes through and queries all sorts of stuff in terms of running processes, running ports. So almost immediately when you pull this up, the thing that jumps to my, uh, to my eye is that explorer.exe process. What is Explorer.exe? Anybody? Yeah, it's basically Windows. It's what you look at every day. It's your shell. It is the, the GUI, the GUI environment for Windows. Again, one of those things that everyone knows is supposed to be there, but I'm not entirely certain what it is. Um, in this case, there were two instances running, and one of them had a capital E, and one of them had a lowercase e. Yeah, that shouldn't happen. The file is only just once on disk. It should have a static name. Uh, and in reality, it should be a lowercase a. Um, so when you see something like Explorer next to another instance of Explorer, and there's a variance like that in capitalization or spelling, that should be a big red flag. But in order to determine what's going on, we looked a little more deeply at it. WinAudit also generates a list of all open ports. In this case, uh, if you look back here, the one that had the strange, uh, the capital E there, was process out here, PID 260. PID 260 was also had an active listener on port 19. What's port 19? Character generation port. Is that any business on a Windows box? No, it's an entirely Unix Linux program. Has no Windows utility whatsoever. Um, and if you look at the path of the PE file, the actual executable file that was used to spawn this process, we're looking at something that was sitting in C, Windows, add-ins, explorer.exe. Again, almost all of your legitimate Windows system files are going to sit either in the system root, C, Windows, or in C, Windows, System32. This one, they've added an extra folder, or the folder does exist, but they put it in the add-ins folder. It looks legitimate enough when you just go looking through it. If you're just wading through the file structure, you see add-ins, explorer.exe, it doesn't raise a flag. But when you Take a moment to actually look at it, you can understand the anomalies. So the port 19 listener, that's another huge anomaly. The fact that it was also bound to port 77, that's another anomaly. And the fact that it was also bound to 43958, that's another anomaly. So now we've got the wrong location, the wrong name, and it's listening on three different ports that I don't typically see involved in the Windows system. Once again, extremely good indicators that this is really something evil not something that should be done. So, you sniff some traffic, perhaps you see outbound communications or inbound communications that are not supposed to be happening. You've pulled some data from RAM, you've looked at the processes that are running, you've compared those to the open ports. Uh, perhaps you perform that external port scan I just talked about because you want to double check the results you're getting from your monitor software because you cannot trust it, because if it's a compromised system, it can be rooted and they can be lying to you from the ground up. So now that you've done everything you can with the running system, 
It's time to unplug it, take a forensic image, and do offline analysis. Because again, any analysis you're doing on the compromised system is relying on its operating system. And if its operating system is also owned, it does you very little good because you can't trust your results. So now that we've gotten the box, we've gotten the volatile information that will be lost when we unplug it, collect it, it's time to unplug it, stop that hard drive dead in its tracks, pull it out and image it. Uh, this isn't a forensics class, so I'm not gonna get into how, how to do an image, but uh, freeware tools that you can use. Helix, it's a great tool. It's got a, it's got a DD on it, it's got another tool called DCFL DD, which is nothing but the Linux DD modified by the U.S. Defense Computer Forensics Lab to include some hash analysis technology uh, that will actually do a verification that the results you got are actually valid. Uh, Linen is a commercial product that's uh, Linux for NCASE that is available. It's also on the Helix CD, so you can boot it up, fire it up, and collect Linen. Uh, there's another one called Raptor, um, which provides, uh, I believe, the easiest interface, but then again, it's our tool. <laughs> it's free, so I'm not going to sign anything. Um, it, it basically is nothing but a point and click GUI that provides you an easy GUI front end to the DCFL DD. So you don't have to worry about mounting and getting your read write mount permissions correct. You just point and click, this is the target drive, here's the suspect or the, the image drive, bring it in, suck it down, and you got it. Uh, so basically, with a boot CD and an external USB hard drive, you can go out and get an image. And if you're using one of these tools, it's really hard to do damage. They're forensically sound to start with. They automatically mount anything that they do mount in read-only mode, so it does help. You can get these things and, and, and do it in a, a way to later be admissible in court. So once you've got your image and you're going to start doing some analysis of this image, what are you looking for? Well, one of the most common techniques used uh, in, in doing an intrusion detection is time stamping. And the theory here is that if I've determined through logs that this PC was compromised, and I had an IDS or an IPS hit showing an active attack against this box at 0200 in the morning on a certain date, then I'm going to go look at the forensic image I've taken of that box. I'm going to sort it by the modified access or created dates of each file, and I'm going to look what happened to this system at 2 in the morning last night. And so that way, I can, if it was created by the attacker and it was accessed by the attacker, I can look using timestamp analysis and determine what is taking place on that system. Is there, you know, do I have 20 new files scattered all over the place that all were dropped at 201 because they compromised and then started spreading evil throughout the system, which is the typical, uh, typical method. Now, have you heard of time stomp? This is a tool that allows you to go in and set these dates and times on, on the Windows system to whatever the heck you want. So as an attacker, you get your malware in, your malware kit automatically, most of these things are automated. Uh, you get some idiot to open up an email through a spear phishing attack. You, you make it look like it came from someone they know. You give it a nice Word document. You have a, you know, some sort of legitimate data inside of the Word document, but you also have an exploit that's taking advantage of the most recent flawed Word, and you own the system. Now what it will typically do is that first dropper, that first piece of malware that gets on is going to immediately call home to a malware server and just start dumping lots of compressed malware back, expand it, and then just start dropping it all over the place. So the theory of timestamp analysis is that when that happens, I can then look at everything that was done during that one minute period and identify the various pieces of malware. With timestamp, they can just build right into the script. Okay, now that I've dumped all of this stuff in, and it's sitting in my system 32 directory. Well, see what the uh, time is for known Windows system files that get created at installation time, and then have the rogue stuff that I just stuck in there mimic. Make it look exactly like the rest of it. Modify the max times, the modified access and created times, so that it blends in. Uh, and, and that has been thwarting uh, forensic analysts for a while because of the fact that it's harder to actually detect it. But, the beauty of it is, time stomp is a little bit inefficient. Um, with NTFS, the new technology file system, all data, the metadata, the timestamps, information about directory structures, information about contents of directories and files, 
is contained in a structure called the MFT, the master file table. The master file table basically consists of one entry per file or folder on your system, and they're one byte in length, each entry. And they're broken up into a series of different attributes. And each attribute contains a set amount of information. The standard information attribute for each record entry contains the modified access and created time series. However, inside of the short file name, which is the 8.3 compliant name, and the long file name, which is the full up to 255 character file name, for each file or folder, there is a duplication of those dates and timestamps. All three are duplicated again. Windows doesn't bother to query them. The only one Windows checks when it goes to actually display that is the standard information entry. So the only one that timestamp bothers to modify is the standard information entry. So if you actually go through, you can write a script that will manually parse your, uh, your MFT, your master file table, pull out the date and times from the standard information attribute on everything in your system, compare it to those that are duplicated in the short and long file name attributes, and look for deltas. Wherever they don't match, big red flag, you should probably be looking at that file because it's probably now where it's probably going to need been time solved. Other things you can do, hash analysis. So you're looking at your system, you've got 500 gigabytes image, and now you're trying to find out what out of all this big haystack is the evil needle. Um, there are large data sets by the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, <coughs> as well as numerous law enforcement agencies um, that are available. There's also commercial sets. There's a company called Bit9 that has probably the world's largest hash set. And basically what they do is every time software is released, they buy it. And they hash every single file. And, and by a hash, we're just talking MD5, SHA-1s, one-way function. You take any known data set, run it through the hash algorithm, it generates a value. And every time you run that same piece of data through the same hash, you get the same value. So it's just it, sometimes generically called a digital thing. You can use these hash sets to go through places where evil is frequently dropped, such as Windows System 32. Call out everything that is known. And that only leaves the unknown. And then you analyze the unknown. Now, some of them are going to be legitimate, just unknown or modified slightly, but legitimate. And others might be evil. Um, the other thing you can do with hash is once you've identified, yes, this is an evil file, get its MD5 hash, use these search tools to then scour the rest of the image for duplicate copies of the same file, which will frequently be put in other locations and renamed. Because again, when the hacker gets hold of the system, they typically want to make sure they keep it. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about um, malware that exists only in RAM, just resident malware. They take over your system, they put a process up in your, in your memory space, it runs, it does evil, but it has nothing on disk. So as soon as you unplug it to do your, your offline imaging, you've lost all the evidence. Problem is, every time you reboot your system, the hackers lost control of your box as well. And now they have to break back in. So while it does exist, uh, I've seen it only in extremely specialized applications with extremely dedicated adversaries. Um, most of the time, people are going to drop something on your hard drive to be persistent. So it'll survive a reboot, reload it back up into memory space at the end of it. So most of the time, you're going to find it on the disk. So once you actually identify a piece of malware that is evil, like the Explorer we saw earlier, what do you do with it? Uh, again, there's there's Many people in this room are probably better at um, disassembly than I will ever be, so I'm not going to belabor this point. But, general topic, extract it from the image, put it in a sandbox. There's, there's commercials like Norman Sandbox, there's uh, virtual machines, which is I think what most everybody uses for this. Um, configure a VM, drop Procmon on it, drop a, a different tools that are actually going to just monitor what is going on in the system, monitor the changes on the system. Put an external sniffer on the box to see what communication goes out. Fire off the malware, see what it does. Look at the registry changes that are made. Look at the files that it drops. Look at the network communications it attempts. You may have to set up a bogus DNS server to allow some resolution when it tries to actually go out and go to a particular domain name. Give it the name of something that has a listener on it and allow it to make a connection to something you control in the sandbox environment to see what communications are there. And then you can actually start trying to interact with it doing a behavioral malware analysis. If the, if the command is sent and I, I send a reply, what does it do? If I allow the TCP connection to complete, what does it then do? Um, 
if I see it as expanded out and drop 16 other pieces of malware, what are each one of those pieces of malware? Uh, so that's, that's the basic idea. You execute it and you monitor the changes both on the network and on the system. And then if you're really good, you can pull the binaries out and start actually doing this assembly, reversing the things to see exactly what they do. The Windows registry itself also has a, a wealth of information. The thing to understand about the registry is that if you go into RegEdit, you see HP local machine, HP current user. None of that actually exists on disk. That's all just a virtual representation of data that's stored elsewhere. The majority of them are in system hives stored inside the system root system 32. Um, there's also an ntuser.dat file in each user's home directory that actually stores the uh, HP user data. So a couple of keys that are of interest from a uh, incident detection perspective. HP current user, which again, you would extract that from the ntuser.dat file for the user's account in question. Microsoft Windows current version explorer map network drive MRU shows you network drives that were mapped, again, many, many, many hacks in the Windows world that occur, once they own one of your boxes, they're going to start, particularly if they can get a valid username and account, they're going to start trying to just map to other drives. So if you look at this particular key, it gives you a list of drives that have been mapped to this system. So we've determined there's malware on the system, we've determined the system is compromised, let's now see where they've been so I can identify the other compromised systems in my network. This particular key will store this information and tell you where they've been. And if you see things like here with the C dollar signs, again, admin shares. They have connected to another system using an admin share, which means they have some valid administrator credential for that system as well. Now you've got another one you need to go image and do the analysis of because that's another hack box. Similar key is in the same location. Uh, current version Explorer map points. If they do a full map where they actually assign it a drive letter and it persists, that goes in the first key mission. If they do just sort of a dynamic access on the fly, like go to the CMD, or sorry, they just go start, run, and then use the UNC, the Universal Naming Convention, whack, whack, computer name, whack, share name, to dynamically look at a, another computer's data, that will get stored here. And again, if you see the C dollar sign, or G dollar sign, or what any of those dollar sign admin shares, they own the other system as well. Take it under advisement, pull it offline. Another one that is a handy key, again under ntuser.dat, is the recent docs. This key actually records, based on the extension of the documents that have been viewed, uh, about the last 10 or so um, files that were accessed of that type. Now, most of the time, this may give you some indication of where they've been looking at your data, but one that I like to really look at is the zip. Because if they're installing malware, they're frequently going to bring down bundles of packages. Look at the zips and see what has been accessed on the zip line. Uh, and look at the, uh, the various zips that have been accessed and see if there's additional malware you can identify on the system. And finally, the SAM hive itself. This is located uh, in Windows System 32 in a folder called simply or in a file called SAM. This is where your local user accounts exist. And if you open it up with a forensic tool like Access Data's Registry Viewer, which you can download for free off the Access Data website, um, this tool will actually open the SAM, allow you to view the account names, and also will tell you information like when was this account last used. So if you're looking at it, it will tell you, okay, yes, they are using my local administrator account. This was the last time they came onto the system with that particular account. You can also look at the last failed login times from these things, because if someone's doing a broad password brute force guessing attack, they will frequently target it against that RID 500, that default administrator account, and try brute force password guess attacks. If you see multiple systems that have that last failed login time from that local account at about the same period of time, that's probably what you're facing. So once you've looked at this, you've identified, okay, this is the malware. This is what the malware does. This is the network indicators. These are my host space indicators. It drops the following registry keys. It puts the following pieces of malware in the following locations. Now you've got heuristics you can use. You now start expanding the scope, looking for other systems on your network that are owned. You can use a manual process where you just fire off something to your network defenders and say, everybody go look at this particular folder for this particular file name. If it's there, fire or flare the IT security group can run. Or you can use something uh, a little more sophisticated like an enterprise forensic tool. The major uh, 
Computer Forensics Vendors, Access Data, and Guidance Software both develop and uh, use a uh, enterprise model where you actually can run a servlet or a little applet on every computer in your enterprise, and your IT security team can sit in one place, put in the MD5 hash of malware, put in the name of the file in a specific location, sweep the entire enterprise, and every machine that matches that search criteria will raise an alarm, and you can actually do the uh, imaging of the systems live across the wire. Um, a, there, there are a variety of different tools. I think uh, the guidance software tool is probably the leader of this at this point. All right, so that's it. I think we're right on time. I do appreciate everybody showing up last hour. That's tough. I must have a good caffeine in today. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, well, you uh, there's some malware which are able to see sandboxes. So, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. It, it's, it's, the, it's the never any cat and mouse game. Uh, some malware now, in order to avoid being reversed, is actually doing things like uh, virtualization detection. If the text is running in a virtual machine, it shuts down. Now, uh, there's different things you can try. You, if, if it cracks out on VMware, try it in, in parallels or try it in you know, a, a different virtualized environment. Uh, also, the, the Norman Sandbox products, these sandbox products that just actually run um, at sort of a hardware level. The, you know, the software is running, but not virtually. That, that can sometimes evade. And it's simply a matter of trying to outthink the hack. If the malware is designed to detect virtualization in one platform, try it in another platform, try it in another. And at the end of the day, you may not be able to do it. You may have to run it just on a dedicated box, take it out of the VM. And it's not a big deal. You, just, you need to select that box and it's done. So you basically recreate your testing environment, but on bare metal. Um, make a ghost of it and then just go ahead, run it, consider that one hosed, wipe it, zeros all the way across, to make sure you get it all, reload your ghost, and then do your next set of tests. But yeah, it is, it, it, they are getting tricky. Other questions? All right, folks, I appreciate your time. You got a good comment. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have our CDF price giving ceremony next door and also our final ever charity option. So just head on next door and also the closing. Thank you. Bye bye.